Through the years following the assassination, I have yet to meet anyone who is completely satisfied with the Warren Report's conclusions. The vast majority of Americans suspect there is much more to the story than the conclusion that Oswald had acted as a lone nut. The problem, of course, is that the U.S. government has yet to uncork the rest of its evidence. It's high time it did. For this country to find a satisfactory resolution of this national tragedy, two fundamental questions must be answered. Number one, who exactly killed the president? And number two, why did he do it? The public must be given full and accurate information on both questions before we can put this painful part of our history to rest. The first question has been effectively answered. A close, thorough, An honest examination of the available evidence proves beyond a reasonable doubt that Lee Oswald and Oswald alone killed President Kennedy. The evidence is all out there in the Warren Commission's findings. Over the years, two books have done a commendable job of explaining this evidence. Gerald Posner's Case Closed and David Bellin's You Are the Jury. This answer to the second question, why Oswald killed Kennedy, has never been satisfactorily answered, certainly not by the Warren Commission. After examining the evidence available to me, I think it is safe to assume, at a minimum, that Oswald killed Kennedy for ideological, political reasons. Perhaps he was trying to impress the Soviets and Cubans. We don't know how the Cubans reacted to Oswald's threat to kill Kennedy, and perhaps we never will. Or perhaps we will when Castro is dead. I am frequently confronted with all types of wild assassination theories expounded by the seemingly endless line of buffs and pundits. In almost every case, I find that they have conducted their investigations ass-backwards. The fundamental rule in conducting any investigation is that you must always start from the beginning and work your case forward. As you follow the evidence, it will eventually lead you to the suspect. It is only then, at the end of the investigation, that it becomes clear who the guilty party is. But these buffs always start from the end from their preconceived conviction or theory, and work back to the beginning. They first decide who the guilty party is. The mafia, right-wing fanatics, the military-industrial complex, the Castro-Cubans, and then they go about proving this theory using only the evidence that supports it. What these people fail to understand is that just because a particular person or group might have a reason to kill Kennedy, that doesn't mean they did. Politically motivated conspiracy theories are still popular. Immediately after the assassination, the Kremlin put out the story that right-wing extremists in America were behind Kennedy's death, not the communist Oswald recent release of top-secret information on the Soviets shows that the Soviet Union, Castro, and the American Communists, almost from the day of the assassination, tried to deflect suspicion that the left wing was responsible for the act and tried to focus on the right wing. Several of the early writers on the subject had clear left-wing leanings and backgrounds and it would appear that their intent was either to mislead the American public or steer its thinking away from any possible connection to the left. Looking back from the perspective of today and taking into account not only those early books but the immensely successful, immensely misleading movie JFK, I'd have to conclude that they largely succeeded. Oliver Stone's JFK is one of the most outrageous examples of misdirection I have ever seen. I don't doubt for a second that Stone has every reason in the world to be bitter about his Vietnam War experience, and I could appreciate his anger at the U.S. government and the military-industrial complex. But disinformation is a major tool in the espionage wars, and the Cubans and Soviets are masters of it. Stone, 
on a visit to Cuba to receive an award for one of his films seems to have swallowed the Cuban version, Jim Garrison's story, Hook, Line, and Sinker. In Stone's theory, the pro-Castro Oswald is the innocent patsy. Stone decides that, surprise, the military-industrial complex killed Kennedy with the assistance of the CIA, the FBI, and the Dallas police. In fact, Stone says that I played an integral part in the plot. I do hope JFK helps Stone exercise some demons from his Vietnam experience. Postscript. In this book, I think I have made it abundantly clear that I believe that Oswald killed President Kennedy. I am convinced Oswald acted alone. I arrive at my conclusions based solely upon the readily available evidence. It's all there for anyone to examine. While I have already discussed the issues surrounding the Soviets and Cubans, I have not gone into any great deal about the actual evidence of the assassination. In this book, I simply told my story, how I saw the events unfold from my perspective. Yet, I cannot resist at least a short discussion of the evidence because time and again, I am confronted by people challenging my basic conclusion that Oswald acted alone. A common objection to the conclusion that Oswald alone shot the president is that there is no way any person could have fired three shots in approximately six seconds. First, the six-second theory derives from the FBI's incorrect conclusions based on the Zapruder film. The Bureau decided that the first shot hit Kennedy. At this point, the clock begins ticking. The FBI then concluded that the second shot hit Governor John Connolly approximately three seconds later. The final shot, still according to the FBI, then hit the president in the head some six seconds after the first. What is more likely is that the first shot missed and the second hit Kennedy in the neck and then Connolly in the back. Then, six seconds after the second shot, Oswald fired the third shot. Posner put forth an intriguing theory on this point in case closed, as he may have discovered evidence that the first shot did in fact miss, giving Oswald over nine seconds from the time the first shot was fired to the third. Posner discovered that Zapruder, while holding his camera in his hands, jiggled it about three seconds before conventional wisdom had the first shot being fired. This jiggle is consistent with an involuntary muscular reflex of a person filming an event when a gun is fired nearby, something which has been documented and accepted in the scientific community. Also, at the same instant Zapruder jiggled the camera, a little girl who is running in the film stops dead in her tracks, consistent with someone who has just heard a gunshot. Posner's theory is intriguing, and if true, then Oswald did indeed have over nine seconds, more than enough time, for a Marine sharpshooter to have fired three shots. Just as important, many people fail to realize that Oswald had perhaps 10 to 15 seconds to line up his first shot. Once he had it lined up, then he fired. Within the next six, according to the FBI, or nine seconds, according to Posner, Oswald had to fire only two more shots, not three. The FBI had an agent recreate the shooting sequence. He accomplished it easily. In short, Oswald had more than enough time to get off all three shots. People also confront me with the magic bullet problem. I am no forensic scientist, but I think I can give a fair summary on why there is no magic to that bullet. Contrary to Oliver Stone's portrayal of the facts, Kennedy and Connolly were not sitting in perfect straight back postures in a line. Kennedy's seat was slightly higher than Connolly's and a few inches off to the right side. When the second shot was fired, the Zapruder film indicates Kennedy was leaning forward, perhaps in reaction to hearing the off-target first shot. Connolly is twisting around in his seat to look behind him, also apparently reacting to the first shot. He is holding his hands down on his thigh. The two men are in this position when the second shot is fired.
the bullet goes into the back of Kennedy's neck at an angle and exits at the front through the knot of his tie. The threads of his tie were examined. They were blown outwards, consistent with an exit wound. The bullet, still moving rapidly, now begins to tumble in the airspace between Kennedy's neck and Connolly's back. This tumbling is consistent with ballistic studies of bullets that enter and then exit without striking any bone, as was the case with Kennedy. The tumbling bullet then enters Connolly's upper back sideways, not front or back first. Connolly's back wound is oblong, consistent with a sideways entry, not a normal entry wound. The bullet, now traveling through Connolly's body, smashes sideways into one of his ribs. Deflected off the bone, the bullet's direction changes slightly and exits Connolly's body a little lower, just below the nipple. The bullet, now traveling more slowly because of its impact with the rib and having traversed two bodies, continues its downward path. It has just enough speed to strike Connolly's wrist, damaging the wrist bones. The slowed bullet now ricochets off Connolly's wrist bone, penetrates his pant leg, and barely embeds itself in the flesh of his thigh. When Connolly was placed on a stretcher at Parkland Hospital, his trousers were removed. He was placed on a second stretcher and urgently wheeled into emergency surgery. During the frenzied efforts to save Connolly's life, medical personnel did not notice the bullet fall out of Connolly's leg and onto the first stretcher. A short time later, a hospital attendant discovered this bullet and gave it to an FBI agent who gave it to a Secret Service agent. Despite Oliver Stone's claims, the bullet did not zig and zag. Its path is easily understood when carefully examined. Again, it is important to remember that Kennedy was leaning forward and Connolly had turned to look behind him. People also take issue with the bullet's condition, which they describe as pristine. First, one should remember that no two bullets change condition in exactly the same way when fired into an object. Second, the bullet is not pristine. It is partially flattened on one side, consistent with the bullet hitting Connolly's ribs sideways when it was traveling at its highest speed. Now, of course, this bullet is the one that conspiracy theorists say was planted to frame Oswald. So what did they do? Did they get a hammer to flatten it out a little bit? Of course, they always use that word pristine, but it isn't pristine, as you can see. Or what did they do? Did they, did they fire a hundred bullets from Oswald's rifle? Of course, how did they get Oswald's rifle and then put it back? And then, well, let's look at these bullets now. Let's use this one. No, no, let's use this one. No, 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 I think we should use this one. It has to show some kind of damage. We're trying to frame Oswald here. Uh, what do you think will happen when it goes through? Should we, should we pretend it goes through a skull, hard bone, or should we pretend it goes through soft tissue? Sometimes people get shot, and all the bullet does is go through soft tissue. Why don't we do both of them? Why don't we plant two, two bullets? <laughs> How would you make a decision like that? Folks... If I had $20 million, I could make the funniest fucking movie of all time. And all I would need to do, all the material is right there for me using the conspiracy theorists' theories. <laughs> of course, I wouldn't do it because I'm not a callous person. I wouldn't... I wouldn't show any disrespect to the Kennedy family or to the American public at large because this was an American tragedy. But my gosh, if I, if I was that type of person, holy cow, what a comedy I could make. Prior to that, the bullet had only traveled through soft flesh 
After striking the rib, it rapidly began to lose its velocity so that when it hit its next hard object, Connolly's wrist, it was traveling much more slowly, preventing any further damage to the bullet. There is also one inescapable bit of evidence many ignore. The traces of lead recovered from Connolly's wrist conclusively match the so-called stretcher bullet. The bullet was copper jacketed with a lead core. The core was exposed on the rear end only. A small amount of it was squeezed out like toothpaste from a tube and left in Connolly's wrist. People also attacked the conclusion that Oswald acted alone by arguing that the final and fatal shot to Kennedy's head came from the front, not the rear, from where Oswald was shooting. I found it hard to believe that this phantom gunman was able to set up on the grassy knoll with dozens of people within yards of him, including amateur filmmaker Abraham Zapruder, fire one shot, and... Why didn't anyone see him? These people say that a second gunman had to have been positioned in front in the area of the grassy knoll. The answer to that argument, first, the evidence clearly indicates that the third shot came from the rear. Second, there is simply no credible evidence to support the second gunman theory. In the examination of the president's body, doctors found a small bullet hole in the back of his head. The front right side of Kennedy's head was blown open. When a bullet enters a body, it leaves a small entry wound. When it exits, it either leaves a similarly small hole or it fragments when it enters the body and blows a bigger hole when it exits. The brutal fact is Kennedy's brain matter was blown toward the front of the car and some was recovered on the inside of the front windshield. Bullet fragments were found on the floorboards by the driver of the president's limo. When the bullet fragments were recovered, it was also discovered that the inside of the front windshield had dents or nicks in it, consistent with high-velocity bullet fragments hitting it. Prior to the assassination, the president's limo had been kept in pristine condition. The windshield had no nicks or dents. Clearly, the bullet entered the rear of Kennedy's head and exploded out the front. Still, people countered with the fact that with the third shot, Kennedy's head rocketed backward and to his left. I blame the movies for this misconception, for on the screen, people shot from the front are almost always flung backward. In real life, it is just as possible for a person to jerk in the opposite direction due to the jet effect. Folks, I am not a physicist nor a mathematician, and I'm not a movie maker. I was never a soldier, meaning I've never seen anyone killed. Thank God. But I am a human being with a head, a neck, and a body. Last time I checked, my head is attached to my neck and my spine. If a bullet going 2,000 feet, if a metal bullet going 2,000 feet per second strikes the back of my skull, I'm going to move a little bit forward because of the force, but then because my neck is not made out of rubber like they are in cartoons, it can't go 15, 20 feet in front of me. It can only go a little bit, and then because the spine and the neck are attached to the head, but that force has not been expended yet, it's going to snap backwards. You don't need math or physics. You just need to be a human being with common sense. Forensic scientists have long ago discovered that when a person is shot in the back of the head, a jet effect could cause the head to jerk backward. This finding has been documented and recreated on film. On the second point, that there must have been a second gunman, there is no credible evidence to support this theory. I know various people have come forward over the years claiming to have seen this phantom gunman, 
but their stories simply do not hold water. And the evidence collected from witnesses who gave statements to officials in 1963 and 1964 of all the people standing in Dealey Plaza, only one described seeing a puff of smoke near the tree line along the grassy knoll at approximately the same time the first shot fired and missed. That's it. Nothing more. Over the years, many conspiracy theorists have taken this puff and either extrapolated a second gunman out of it or have distorted the evidence to prove there was a second gunman. But what could cause a puff of smoke? We know one of the three shots missed and the evidence indicates that it was Oswald's first shot. At the same time this shot missed, a man standing near the grassy knoll was struck by a high-speed object that grazed his face and caused slight bleeding. A portion of the curb a short distance in front of him was struck by a hard, high-speed object consistent with a bullet. The errant bullet was never found consistent with a bullet shattering upon impact with a concrete curb. The curb was in the possible line of fire for Oswald's missed shot. It is my theory that the first shot missed the motorcade and hit the curb, causing fragments of both curb and bullet to fly through the air, one of which struck the man and another of which skidded into the dirt under the trees of the grassy knoll, causing a puff of dust. No one in Dealey Plaza on November 22nd ever said they saw a second gunman. If there had been a second gunman on the grassy knoll, he would have been seen. The area is small and close to the street. Zapruder and others would have been less than 10 yards from this gunman. Dozens of people, including law enforcement officers, swarmed up to the grassy knoll within seconds of the shot being fired, no doubt confused by the unusual acoustics of Dealey Plaza, in their efforts to find where the shots came from. None of these people saw a second gunman. Furthermore, how could this second gunman leave no trace? There were no spent bullet casings or any other signs that anyone had fired shots from that area. Where did this fired bullet go? A shot from the grassy knoll would have gone smack into the crowd of bystanders waving at Kennedy, yet no one was hit, nor did anyone report hearing, feeling, or seeing any bullets fired in their direction. People also take issue with the conclusion that Oswald shot the rifle from the sixth floor, where his rifle and his prints all over a makeshift sniper's nest were recovered by pointing out that it would have been impossible for him to get from the sixth to the second floor before a Dallas police officer and Roy Truly, the manager of the book depository, saw Oswald in the second floor lunchroom. I suspect the police officer and Truly misjudged how quickly they got to the second floor lunchroom. The officer, who was riding his motorcycle in the motorcade, dumped his motorcycle on Elm Street, ran up the stairs to the front door of the depository, identified himself to and briefly conversed with Truly, paused at the elevator, pushed the elevator button, then decided to abandon that effort and run up the flight of stairs to the second floor all of which, in my view, had to take at least two minutes, more than enough time for Oswald to run down the stairs from the sixth to the second floor. When my fellow agents, Ike Lee and Bob Barrett, reenacted Oswald's dash from the sixth floor window to the second floor lunchroom, each time they did it in less than a minute, there is no mystery to the fact that Oswald fired his rifle from the sixth floor, made his way to the second floor lunchroom, and then fled the building altogether. Anyone who has examined the evidence carefully as I have over many years cannot help but come to the conclusion that Oswald was the lone gunman. Most people have come to their conclusions about the assassination from short, partial readings of different theories. Very few people have examined all the evidence. When they do, they follow step by step the actions Oswald took prior to the assassination, purchasing the rifle under an assumed name, trying to kill General Edwin Walker in April 1963, coming to the Paines home and retrieving his rifle the day before the assassination, and carrying it disguised as curtain rods when he hitched a ride to work on November 22, 1963, and they follow his post-assassination path to Oak Cliff, 
where he murdered Officer Tippett in cold blood, an act witnessed by five people, and then, in the movie theater, tried to take a second shot at an officer with the same gun he used to kill Tippett. With all this evidence and more, for the life of me, I don't understand why some people still don't think Oswald did it, or that there was a second gunman. As I said, the evidence is there for anyone to examine.